Hi, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure for me to do this um, video message to you today because I'm introducing A Time for Grace. This is my new book that's just come out, Sacred Guidance for Everyday Life, published by Hay House. And I wanted to take a few minutes to share the content of this book because I I so believe in it. I mean, I think every author believes in the work that they write, but um, so it's my turn to share that. And I think for me, as I look at the world, if ever there was a time that we needed grace, it's now. But that's not just what this book is about. What I did was I wanted to explore, um, to offer you a path of what it's like to perceive the world around you beyond your capacity to reason with the world. Grace, for example, is a mystical substance. It's not something that logic can explain. It's a mystical substance. Now, what I mean by that is that the mystical world, the invisible, the sacred, the holy world, operates on mystical law. And mystical law is like, the way I would explain it is, it's like mist, and mist eventually, and mist is fluid. It's fluid. And so it has this sort of amorphous feeling to it. But mist eventually forms, say, decides to form in an area and become a storm. And so it forms storm clouds. And once the storm clouds gather, it sort of has a location. And then eventually you can kind of predict what kind of storm, not always, but you start to get elements that our logical mind can kick into. The size of the clouds, the temperature, the, the, the wind patterns. But eventually water forms and it becomes rain. And Rain then comes to the earth and it's freezing and it solidifies into ice. So this whole system is actually one in the same at various degrees or levels of existence. And that's like the laws. So the mystical laws are like the mist. They've yet to form and they require choice. They require our interaction. They require the co-creative process. And as we make choices, and collectively and individually, that mist begins to take the shape of, we could use the analogy of a weather pattern. And then that weather gathers in a certain area, and eventually it comes into creation. And the laws of the physical world are like ice. They're solid. There, we know exactly what the law of gravity is. You just jump and we're going to fall no matter who we are. So we know these laws as they show up in the physical world. Cause and effect. I'm going to hit this and it's going to go equal to the velocity with which I hit, the force with which I hit it. So those laws make sense to us. It's much more challenging to grasp that those laws exist in the non-physical world, in the world of energy and in the world of grace. We are now getting the world of energy and physics and quantum physics. We're seeing that light and particles also behave according to law because the nature of God is law. The nature of God is law, light, and love. Those are the three basic elements of, of how we can understand the nature of God. So where does grace fit in? Grace is a mystical substance, an extra light, a, a type of light that takes the shape of the assistance you need at the time. It could be compassion. It could be endurance. It could be patience. It could be courage. It could be faith. But grace pours into you like an extra dose of something you need that you cannot generate at the time. An, an experience that many of you could probably relate to as an experience of grace is that we have all in our lives gotten into heated arguments with people and with people we love, which is a pretty dicey territory. 
And if you have a history with that person, and the history includes painful events, and it's your habit to pull out those events and toss them in the face of this person, like, well, you always did this, and remember this, and da-da-da-da, to use your past as a weapon. Sometimes that could be the breaking point in a relationship, like enough of that. I can't undo the past and I just can't take any more. And every now and again, when you get to a place of that kind of heatedness and you want to pull out that one mega wound, <clears throat> you might hear a voice in your head that says, are you sure you want to do that? And you're not even aware that you're hearing a voice because it comes in and it whispers and its point is not that you notice the voice, but that you notice the message. And the message comes in, and often, very often, it's at that point that you'll walk out. You'll just say, "I just the heck with this, and you walk out. And later, as you look back, you think, thank God I walked out. Thank God I didn't say that. Thank God I went out and cooled off. And you don't really stop to pause. Where did that come from? Where did that guidance come from? That guidance that let me know if I do this, <clears throat> there'll be no turning back. And I won't be able to repair it. That's how grace works. Grace comes in, and it's and the and the point of grace, the, the, the point of these holy messages is not that you notice, oh my God, I'm just getting an infusion of grace. But that you perhaps notice that something happened, a thought came to you, a pause came to you, that as a result of it, you were able to endure something that for a moment you thought was unendurable. You had a, a thought came to you and said, you'll get through this, I'll get through this, I always get through things, that somehow you were, you were reminded of your inner courage at a time when you really didn't have the strength or the stamina to remind yourself of that. Grace is that sort of subtle force. It takes us from one situation in which we're losing power, and it transfers us into another situation that is, transforms the situation into something more positive. And it's not necessarily that it's just brimming with positive, but it's enough. It's enough to get you by. Grace is oftentimes comes in the form of a, of, a, of a thought that never occurred to you, that was just the thought, that was enough to get you to the next step. Then, it, and so this, one of the things I explore in this, in this book is how the universe works with us, how the invisible sacred world works, because it has laws and it has rules and it is consistent. And I'll tell you how I came to this, because it's very bold to speak about the invisible world, isn't it? The sacred world. But my, my route to how I understand the nature of God as I do today was not through my background in theology, though it gave me a strong foundation. Not at all. It was through doing thousands and thousands of medical intuitive readings. Because it was through doing readings that I began to really get the power of the human spirit and then the soul. It was through that that I began to understand that we have a bio-spiritual ecology that we live in. That every choice we make is an act of creation. That, that the last thing we are is powerless. And that... The, I am convinced the great reason why we feel compelled these days to develop self-esteem is not so we can say to people, you can't talk to me like that, or here's my boundaries, or this is what I need, or whatever. That's the baby, baby step of, of self-esteem. It's actually to get to the place where you esteem yourself, where you actually recognize how much power you have. And that I think what's characteristic of this journey that we are on together now that's going to last for a while is that we are driven into this state of narcissism and this state of self-focus 
not just so we could become a, a species full of narcissists, though we're close, but rather it's a stage I think we're going through in our evolution in which we must realize how powerful we are, which is, and I think that kind of explains, and I hope I'm doing this uh, clearly, I think that kind of explains why what we are so concerned about today within ourselves is something that previous generations prior to the nuclear age, when all of who we are today began to take shape, it didn't exist. But today we speak about taking our power back. We define ourselves in terms of power. Before, that power was defined in terms of status and money, but not inner power, not inner power. If it was, it was terms of respect and in terms of reputation, something people could get. But it wasn't the same as realizing I've lost my power to a memory. I've lost my power, like the way Teresa of Avila, the saint I so am enchanted with, would say an inner reptile has gotten into you. And it could be a fear, or it could be an illusion, something like Buddha would say an illusion, something you, you absolutely think is real, but it's not. It's not. But that reptile has so much authority over you. And I, I think that one of the powers of grace is that it can help you deal with what you think you can't get help with. And this is why I do a whole section on, on, on what I call defying gravity, which was the earlier name of this book, but I've since updated the book. Um, what I meant by that was that we have the law of gravity where we fall, but in the mystical world, Gravity is what we give weight to, W-E-I-G-H-T. We give our energy to. We give, <clears throat> I oftentimes use this silly example because I want it to be silly in a workshop, and I'll say, how many of you want my pen? And, of course, everyone, they don't, and that's the point. And I said, I want you to remember what it feels like to not have any connection to something, to not care if I use the pen, not use the pen, if you ever see it again. It means nothing to you, nothing. But if I said, you know, whoever gets this pen, I'm telling you, you just, it starts writing out the answers to all your problems. And now I would create an illusion and it would cause people's energy to start hemorrhaging and attaching to this pen and thinking, if I don't get this pen, my life's over. I must have that pen. And all the venom that would be generated in people, all the jealousy, the competition, the this, the that. That's all it would take is one illusion. And Teresa of Avila says that's a reptile. When an illusion gets in your head, when you start attaching your, your precious spirit to something outside of yourself and you assign value to it, you assign power to it, you're assigning your power to it, and you're telling that object to haunt you, to talk to you. You've got to have me or else. You've got to have this car. You have to have this. You have to have to do this or else. There's the equation. And that, that, that is the most irrational thing that a human being can do, but we do it all the time. We, we, are, we are creatures of addiction. We, we decide we have to have this, we have to have that, we have to have attention, we have to have this, da, 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 da. All of that is what we give gravity to, and here's what's true. The more gravity you give to things around you, your past, your memories, your wounds, your this, your that, your this, your that, the stuff you have to have, your addictions, this, attention, that, the more you drain yourself of your power. And so you create a field of psychic weight. You become dense. You, you actually become dense, heavier. And it's reflected in the heavy psychic states people get into, depression, anxiety, heaviness, the absence of creativity, the absence of, of being able to, to hold your attention. And all of that, the dilution of yourself, 
impacts the way in which you energize the laws of creation. So synchronicity, coincidence, action, reaction, because you're out of power, you have to borrow power or utilize the power of others. So you tend to either um, co start complaining as a way of getting a dose of power from somebody, um, or, you, or you start grabbing onto thought forms that are collective thought forms, like all those people. They're ruining our country and they're coming in over the border. All those people, you collective thought forms that other people believe and you start settling into collective thought forms and you let the collective thought form do the work of consciousness for you because you're too exhausted or disempowered to generate high sophisticated perception for yourself, which is truth to pursue truth, to question, to say, I've got to get my soul out of that thought form. It is an illusion and it's a dangerous one. This consciousness is mechanical and it follows the laws. And where grace comes in, again and again, a thousand million ways, but oftentimes we get ourselves weighted down, weighted, W-E-I-G-H-T, when that happens, we have to wait, W-A-I-T, longer for healing, for thinking in terms of what's a, how can I solve this problem, resolution. We get weighted down. And sometimes we get so weighted down, we can't get out by ourselves. And that's where prayer and grace come in. It's like, I can't get, I can't get out by myself. I need, I need a level of light that I'm no longer generating. And that's what grace is. And it happens. And it comes when you pray. So in this book, I describe um, a number of graces so that you can have a sense of how they feel and the power of your graces. And I mean, I'm here, like, I, I'm just enchanted with the grace of understanding. I could ramble on forever. I promise you I would do that. But consider that the, just the word understanding means you better understand me. But now convert it to a grace. Grace is, it means the grace of understanding, which is what you say, like, God, give me the grace to understand the larger picture of what I'm doing here or what I can do to help this person or help me understand this person better because I don't get them and I need grace to get to that altitude. That's how you take a simple word and you fill it with grace and it becomes a, a, it becomes a current that runs through you. I, I really do hope that this book will bring a lot of insight into your life and mostly grace and mostly faith and mostly a sense of how you can empower yourself and the privacy of your thoughts with a simple, true understanding of how this universe operates as a system of law, as a system of love and light. That in fact, I think that's the world we're evolving into that God is love, light, and law. And that's the world we belong into. That's where we're going. I think that it's written in our body. I mean, our body's like a bio-spiritual ecological system. It's a micro-earth, but that's for another discussion. For now, I hope you'll check out my book through Hay House on Amazon or, or and that it will bring you endless blessings. Thank you, everybody.